The Career Development Stakeholders Conference is a conference targeted at cultivating collaboration, partnership, and knowledge sharing between stakeholders in the private and public career development services sectors by discussing career management as a strategy to increase employability of the youth and thereby sustaining livelihoods. The key concepts of this year's conference are knowledge mobilization, career development learning, career management, and sustainable livelihoods. These concepts will address getting the right information to the right people and in the right format to facilitate decision making. Developing learners' ability to make sense of and synthesize knowledge for effective decision making related to career choices, professional development, and career building activity. Career exploration, development of career goals, and the use of career strategies to obtain career goals. And of course, the skills, assets, both material and social, and approaches to be used by individuals and communities in order to survive. The conference is divided into two phases. The webinar themed Career Services and COVID-19 Realities for South Africa, which will take place on the 22nd, 27th and 29th of October 2020 and the online conference, which will take place on the 19th and 20th of November, 2020, themed Career Learning and Management for Sustainable Livelihoods. The contents of the webinar include session one, which addresses implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on delivering career services, with a focus on schooling and post-school education and training sectors. Session two, including an Estonia case study, which addresses online career services as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, session three, which addresses realities for public education and training and the youth of South Africa with a focus on the digital divide. The contents of the online conference include sub theme one, addressing mobilizing knowledge for career learning and career management, Sub-theme 2, addressing partnerships for sustainable livelihoods. This part of the conference will accommodate employers, students, leadership representatives, unemployed youth, youth leadership representatives, professional bodies, career development practitioners, post-school education, training and development providers, private education and training institutions, government departments and trade unions federations. The conference keynote speakers are a combination of international and local speakers with a rich range of knowledge and experience. The speakers will be from various national South African government departments, the private sector, and from some benchmark countries who have embraced technology and its influence on careers. This year's conference leads off from the theme of the previous conference as well as the recommendations thereof, which state that career information must be contextualized and aimed at addressing systemic issues of unemployment and employability. Technology must be used to maximize access to information for citizens with disabilities. Awareness of careers in the changing world has to be created and a multimodal approach to career development services must be adopted and integrated into the curriculum. So join us in this year's conference. Save the dates and ensure you do not miss out on an opportunity to help shape the future of careers in South Africa.
It is a world of great promise and hope. It is also a world of despair, disease and hunger. Nelson Mandela. Mercita is spearheading a career development project with UNISA, ETDP, CETA, UP and SACTA, aiming to further professionalize the field of career development in South Africa. This project has developed a state-of-the-art system to register career development practitioners and support their continued professional development. It has also established the African Journal of Career Development, facilitating the reporting of research around promoting sustainable, decent work. A biennial National Congress for Career Practitioners has been hosted to enable practitioners to come together to reflect on victories and address challenges in the field. It has empowered a feasibility study into homegrown career management interventions for youth and adults in the manufacturing, engineering and related sectors. Finally, this project has enabled SACTA to represent South Africa in the International Career Development Peak Bodies Network, formed to share resources between countries and provide a collective voice for the field. This project is of great national importance towards ensuring decent and meaningful work for all who are willing and able. We would like to thank our members, partners and stakeholders for making this leap possible. guests. My name is Ernest Munna Khutla Rangaka and welcome to the second webinar in this three-part series that forms the first phase of this year's Career Development Stakeholders Conference. Just like the first time, the format of these webinars will be the presentations by speakers followed by a Q&A session at the end. We do encourage audience participation through our chat feature where you can post any comment or question you may have and we will have our speakers answer and address them during the Q&A session. After this webinar series, the two-day conference will take place on the 19th and 20th of November. The purpose of this conference is to bring together stakeholders to share information and knowledge and discuss career management as a strategy to improve collaboration between the public and private sectors to increase the employability of our youth and thereby sustaining livelihoods. Towards this end, the conference will additionally promote collaborative engagement between stakeholders to leverage resources and opportunities. This conference usually happens in person, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to transition to the digital and new normal way of doing gatherings. There would have also been a series of career development forum meetings preceding this conference, which also cannot be run in person. It is for this reason that the DHEAD saw it fit that they host these webinars to allow stakeholders to engage on how we can continue to deliver career services during this COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge the Murasita, who are not only sponsors, but active partners of the CDS and this conference. 
Just to recap, this year's theme is Career Services and COVID-19, Realities for South Africa. The first phase, being the webinars, will center on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on career services in South Africa. Last week, we had our first session, which was looking at schooling and the post-schooling education and training sectors, specifically the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on delivering career services. Today is the second session, which will be looking at the online career services as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will give attention to the Estonia case study. Then on Thursday is the third and final session of the webinar series, and it'll be looking at the digital divide, the realities for public education and training, and the youth of South Africa. Today, we have a high standard of speakers, namely Ms. Christina Orion, who's the Deputy Head of Skills Development and Career Services Department at the Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund. Then we've got Ms. Trudy van Veik. She's the Chief Director of Social Inclusion, Access, Quality and Equity at the DHET. Following that, we'll have Mr. Rata Khalele, who is the Principal Psychologist at the Department of Employment and Labor. Then we'll have Dr. Tashmir Ismail, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Youth Employment Service. And then finally, we'll invite Mr. Letsiho Mukeki, who is the Director of the Career Development Services at the DHET. Now, our first speaker is Ms. Christina Orion. As I mentioned, she's the Deputy Head of Skills Development and Career Services Department at the Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund. Ms. Orion will be talking us through the online career services as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and she will be giving us a deep dive into the Estonian case study. Ms. Orion, if you're there, I'm going to hand over to you. Please remember to unmute your mic and then put your video on. Hello. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you very well. Over to you, ma'am. Great. Yes. First of all, it's uh, such an honor to be with you today here and to be able to share our experiences during these uh, turbulent times. Let me just open my slide program. So, uh, as it was introduced, I work for Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund, which is the main uh, employment uh, service provider here in Estonia and I have been working for career services development uh, for nearly 20 years now uh, and this year has been uh, uh, one of the challenging um, years uh, in developing career services so we had to make some adjustments as I think you also had to do. Uh, my presentation today uh, concentrates uh, on two parts. So I will be explaining how we um, provide career services and what kind of changes we made during the pandemic. Uh, and also I will be introducing uh, our experience with uh, online uh, job fairs. But first of all, a few introductory words about Estonia. We are a very small country in the Northern Europe near, next to uh, Finland, Sweden and Russia. Uh, we only have about 1.3 million people uh, and uh, we speak Estonian language, uh, but we do have a small Russian speaking minority here in Estonia. Uh, Estonia is e country. Uh, we have um, internet connection uh, in most households. 99% uh, of public services are uh, usable online. Uh, we all have uh, our uh, electronic identity cards, which we can use to uh, sign documents uh, and uh, log in into government portals and so on. So one would say that we were quite well prepared for the um, moving online, uh, but still we had some, uh, some challenges. So first of all, I will say a few words about our career services. So before the COVID-19, uh, we also had very diverse uh, ways of uh, providing career services. In Estonia, career services are available for all people, regardless of their age or employment status. So if uh, a person is unemployed, is uh, currently working somewhere, or is retired, they can get free career counseling uh, from our institution. 
Our main client groups are young people and students, uh, also employed and un unemployed people. And as I said, it's all free for everybody, so no charges uh, for the individuals, but no, no charges also for the uh, institutions. So uh, schools and uh, employers can also ask us uh, to provide uh, counselling for their students or for their employees, uh, or to hold some sort of workshops for them. And we also use uh, different channels to provide career services. So, uh, additionally to the face-to-face -face, uh, career counselling, we also provide uh, counselling via telephone, uh, also via email uh, and Skype. And also, uh, we uh, started using Microsoft Teams uh, from this year. And we are planning to open a chat service uh, starting from next year. And the main locations where we provide career services are uh, our offices around Estonia. Uh, we also go uh, regularly to the schools, uh, to the youth centers, to the employers, uh, and we also organize uh, different career events. So job, fair, job fairs, career fairs, uh, career days for young people and so on. So when the COVID-19 uh, lockdown happened in Estonia, we had to close our employment offices uh, in 16th of March this year, uh, which meant that our career specialists had to move uh, to home offices. Uh, they could use the um, regular office as well, uh, but uh, most of them still prefer to work from homes to, uh, to be safe. This also meant that we had to reschedule all the appointments that we had uh, for our clients. Uh, before the COVID-19, uh, I would say that most of the clients preferred to meet with uh, us face to face uh, and a small proportion online. But uh, starting from March, we had to move all the appointments to online uh, environments. Uh, mostly we used uh, telephone, uh, but also Skype, uh, email, and uh, new environment that we uh, started using this year was Microsoft Teams. We used it before for our internal uh, meetings. Uh, but we opened it to client communication as well. And something that we had uh, never done before was online group counseling and online webinars in this in this scale. So this is this was something very new for us as well. Uh, to be successful in this, uh, we had to launch a e guidance working group, which uh, consisted of. Uh, uh, colleagues uh, in uh, our head office uh, in my team, but also we uh, included some of the career practitioners from county offices uh, to get a practical view and experience from, from their work. Uh, and this working group was very crucial to be uh, successful in uh, e-guidance services uh, development. So this working group uh, provided some uh, specific guidelines for our practitioners, how to operate uh, online. Uh, also, they tested out uh, new approaches. Uh, so uh, uh, they um, designed uh, specific uh, webinars uh, or uh, specific group counseling uh, to hold online. Uh, and then they tested it out uh, with our career counselors communities uh, first and then it was made available for the client groups. And as we uh, moved to online environments, uh, we also made some, in, some um, videos uh, for our clients to uh, shortly introduce the different aspects of career planning and uh, 
give them tips that they can use when they uh, they are applying for a job or looking for an educational opportunity or uh, for self-discovery. We use for it uh, a Fightable program. Maybe some of you are uh, familiar with this. So it's a quite uh, popular program, very reliable. It has uh, different uh, packages, so you can use most of the opportunities there, also free of charge. But uh, for this period, at least, we uh, opted for the paid package so we can make uh, more professional videos. And I also wanted to share one of the videos uh, with you, uh, which is about um, uh, three tips for using your CV. It's going to be in Estonian, one minute long, but I will explain the content for you later. So now, can you please uh, open the video? <laughs> Apologies, Ms. Ryan. I'd just love to ask you to just unmute your mic, please. Yes, thank you. So I think you should be seeing my presentation again. Yes? Yeah, it's all good. Thank okay, you. Very good. So this video was about uh, three tips uh, how to compose your CV. And what we highlighted in there is that you have to, um, uh, first of all, uh, have a short introdu introduction uh, sentence about yourself, what you want to highlight uh, in your CV. You have to be creative, but also uh, 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 to, to maintain the um, tastefulness in this uh, document. Uh, also, you have to check for uh, to moving out any irrelevant information to be concrete and precise and check your spelling and so on, some of, some of the tips. Uh, and the, the ending of the video said that uh, a correct CV will leave a good first impression to the employers. Uh, and if you want uh, to um, have a second opinion, you can send your CV to our career practitioners for reviewing and uh, getting maybe some more tips. So this was one of the uh, many videos that we made during this period, and it was entirely made in this fightable program, so no uh, filming was required. Uh, we ho only had to uh, um, choose a layout for the video and different clips for the video from this environment and uh, make this uh, script for the video. Uh, so very easy tool for anybody who wants to um, maybe make their services uh, more uh, attractive online. So let me just move ahead. Uh, now you see uh, our customers uh, uh, evaluation of our services. So we ask, uh, even before the COVID-19 period, we, uh, we have had asked the uh, feedback from our um, customers uh, who have used the career services in our offices. Uh, and uh, we calculate, so to say, recommendation index uh, based on their feedback. 
And during the uh, lockdown, what we observed was that um, actually people who use the online services, they couldn't uh, meet face to face, were very happy about uh, this opportunity. You can see that there is a small peak uh, during the fourth month of uh, 2020. And also the red line, which uh, uh, represents those clients who were not very happy with our service, uh, this one declined. So uh, this data and also the comments that we got from our uh, clients showed us that they were very uh, grateful for our services online. They were very happy with the content and the guidelines that, that they got from our practitioners. Uh, and uh, this was something that was very much appreciated. So, but uh, as I said, uh, this situation also provided some of the challenges for us. Uh, first of all, it was quite uh, tricky for our practitioners to combine a family and work life simultaneously at home offices. Uh, all of the schools in Estonia were also operating uh, online, so children couldn't go to school, so they were at home and the situation at home with family was very different for um, people. Uh, so this was one of the big challenges which was not very easily um, solved. And also we had some uh, question marks for us, ourselves, uh, how the quality of the service um, is uh, com if you compare the face-to-face -face service uh, versus the online service. So, uh, although our clients said that uh, they were quite happy with our services uh, online, still some of them preferred to postpone the online service and uh, meet with our counselor when the opportunity uh, to meet face-to-face -face, uh, was open again. So, uh, and how we try to respond to the new situation. So additional uh, training was provided for career practitioners. Uh, we um, had some training about how to use different ICT tools, specifically the Microsoft Teams, uh, and, but also um, different uh, websites where you can uh, make maybe more interactive uh, tasks for the participants uh, and also how to manage <clears throat> how to manage the counseling online so it's a quite different environment uh, the person can just leave the counseling session uh, face to face that rarely happens and so on we also provided uh, individual support for career specialists. So we, we have this um, career development team uh, here in the head office, uh, and we were available, available sorry. Uh, we were available for our practitioners to maybe some more specific uh, guidance. And we also provided psychological support for our specialists, so supervision and peer-to-peer -peer guidance. And we, what we also observed was that the e-guidance is not for all, so um, uh, our clients, our people in Estonia, do have different skill sets when it comes to ICT skills. Uh, and also some of the people were not psychologically ready to um, com communicate uh, online, even on the phone. Uh, they still prefer to meet face to face for different reasons. Uh, maybe some health issues that they had, some special needs that they had, uh, which um, were an obstacle for online communication. Also, as for our counselors, uh, for the clients as well, uh, the situation at home was very different. 
they had to be taking care of the family. There was not much privacy in some cases. Uh, maybe they didn't have the necessary tools at home or necessary connection at home and so on. So we did have some customers who were um, postponing their counseling uh, and hoping for the better future to meet face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, uh, additionally, uh, we also had uh, online job fairs. Uh, this was also something uh, new for us in this uh, context. Uh, first of all, uh, we've had uh, so-called summer job uh, on summer job fairs previously, which were face to face and were addressed for the young people, uh, including underage uh, job seekers who wanted to have a summer so-called summer job uh, when they were not in school. But this year we had to move it online. Uh, in a very short notice uh, and the main aim for this uh, fair was to mediate uh, vacancies but also internship and voluntary work offers uh, to have some um, guiding workshops uh, and also provide online guidance. We did have a quite extensive um, advertising campaign for this event and it was very um, popular for the uh, participant, participants part, but as we analyzed it later, um, we uh, hoped for maybe more, um, more uh, vacancies, but uh, as it was held uh, in May, uh, when the employers were still quite um, careful uh, in um, advertising their vacancies. So they were unsure if they would have jobs for, to offer and what will happen in their um, line of work. So uh, we did have vacancies, but we hoped for more. And these vacancies that we had had uh, quite good um, uh, number of candidates. So the empl employers uh, were able to choose the good worker for their, themselves. And here you also have the link if you want to check it out uh, later. But uh, we also had a new, uh, new online uh, job fair just a month ago or so. So this situation was now uh, more uh, different. And this uh, job fair was open for everybody. Uh, and had quite a high number of vacancies, uh, considering that we are a small country. So we had over 3,000 vacancies. Uh, some of them were also for Europe, but uh, mostly Estonian. Uh, we had a career seminar, online event, where you could uh, hear inspirational uh, speakers and uh, get some maybe uh, guidelines how to apply for jobs. Uh, and also some people shared their stories. Uh, and we also had uh, specific uh, workshops uh, on how to uh, apply for jobs. And also online career guidance was provided there. So you, ha you could uh, book yourself uh, time with a career counselor during this uh, fair. And these times actually were very popular. So they were, um, they moved uh, quite quickly uh, uh, they were filled quite uh, quite quickly. Uh, we also had uh, a campaign to advertise that we ha are having this kind of event online for the first time. So we made a mass mailing for the job seekers and deployers. Uh, we also had an advertising campaign uh, that we um, that that was uh, visible in the radio, social media. Um, and different outdoor media as well. So we had the digital screens in shopping malls, for example. Uh, we also have this kind of screens in the public transport, in buses, for example. Uh, and also there were some larger screens uh, in the city. 
and uh, we had 74,000 uh, uh, visits to the uh, expo site and this uh, was very good result for us so we were quite happy with this uh, job fair and if we would uh, say what we could learn from this uh, experience is that uh, this kind of job fair is a good opportunity uh, not just because of the COVID, but also because uh, people are online much more these days uh, and it's much easier to uh, to connect with employer online uh, versus if you have to go to uh, some expo center in the city and then uh, go around and uh, trying to find um, the vacancies and trying to find the right employer online you can just during the day, browse the employers, browse the vacancies, and uh, you also had the opportunity to ask from the employer directly in this uh, environment. So, uh, I think this is all from me now. Just, yeah. Thank you for listening, and uh, I, I know that the questions will be later, so I will be waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Ryan, for giving us a better understanding of the Estonian career services. I'm very impressed by what you were able to achieve, despite you know the small size of your country. I think there are a lot of places in the world that can really learn from what you guys have managed to do. Um, just to encourage everyone in the audience to please post your questions, post your comments there about Ms. O'Ryan's presentation, and then she will address them at our Q&A session. Now we are going to head off to our first respondent, who is going to be Ms. Trudy van Veek. Uh, Trudy is the Chief Director of Social Inclusion, Access, Quality and Equity at the DHET. Uh, Ms. Trudy, I'd love to invite you to unmute your audio and activate your video, please, so I can hand over to you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. And firstly, I want to thank Ms. Christina Ryan for a very insightful presentation and on how Estonia has responded not only to the fourth industrial revolution, but also how to adapt very rapidly to changing environments. I've really learned a lot, and I believe that all the participants I see, we are over 156 at this stage. I have learned a lot, and I think that uh, they, I believe that we have benefited from your presentation. My response will be, uh, from the perspective of the Department of Higher Education and Training, as people know that the Department of uh, Higher Education and Training is hosting the National Keta Career Development Services in the country. And we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. We have been established in 2010 and we have learned a lot through the 10 years. And I think through the last eight months in the lockdown and the coronavirus pandemic, we've learned even more. So, um, yes, that is where we stand at the moment. And when I respond to the, the uh, specific presentation of Christina, I will also refer a little bit back to what we are doing. Um, if we look at Estonia and I look at South Africa, firstly, the size of the country is quite different. We have got, what is it now, 56, 58 million people in the country. We have got about 28,000 schools. So we have got a huge country. And I think the biggest challenge in the country is the rural population and the vast number of people that residing not in the urban areas or, or semi-urban areas, but mostly in rural areas. And that that is being accompanied by things like unemployment. And I think um, our... Uh, respondent from Yes will specifically talk about that. But when I look at the strength of the Estonia case, and especially around the, the issue of the COVID time, is that connectivity and the use of information and communication technologies is pivotal to the work that we are doing. And through the 10 years that we have worked on career development services, we have worked on multiple platforms ourselves, 
we have got uh, SMS and a very African thing that's called that's uh, been called the please call me. So you can just send the please call me and the uh, advisor will call you back or a short message uh, service system and uh, the person will call you back. We've got a telephone uh, service, a helpline uh, a, a, in forms of an email. We've got Facebook, Twitter, a career help website. And then our, uh, I think our flagship um, platform is the National Career Advice Portal or the NCAP that I think have to be upfronted much more in the new normal that we're talking about at the moment. So I think when I listen to Christina's presentation, when you have got multiple channels, I think the strength lies in it that when things change rapidly, like in, in the past few, um, few months, we could have moved from one channel to another channel. We could have used um, uh, lesser the telephone system and more the online services because it was already there and it was already established. And I'm very grateful for my big team, my career development services team, that they have had the foresight to have a national career advice portal and email and all these electronic means that they are communicating with the clients. One of the things that Christina has raised that's for me very important is the decentralized venues of where career development service is being brought to the people at the local areas. And that is one of our uh, approaches also, where we have got Seketa centers, for example, in our labor centers. Apologies, it seems we might have lost Miss Trudy von Weg. I just want to check with our technical team if anyone's able to help Trudy. Trudy, I don't know if you can still hear me. Okay, I've, I've managed myself. The technical team is on its way, so I think I've managed right. myself for this one. Okay, okay I'm back. Back to you. Um, colleagues, uh, oh, oh, then I think uh, I was talking about the decentralized venues. It's a very important thing because Christina later in her presentation has alluded to the fact that it's not psychological, uh, it's not, people are not psychologically ready and they, they've got personal preferences that has to be taken into account. And the they, um, way that they are using electronic tools is very important, as well as connectivity. In our country, connectivity is a huge issue. And we are working with people. I always say it's not the hardware, it's not the software but it's the warm way that is the most important way. We are working with people and we are working with people's fears. We are working with people's minds and we're working with people all the way. So we must not have a barrier of technologies between you and the information and the guidance and the advice or the counseling that you are providing to, your, to the client that's in front of you. And then... Uh, interesting what she said was also that people initially prefer face-to-face -face or telephone counseling and it still remains the core service. But we see that over the past three years, the, in, even in South Africa, we saw that there was an increase in online services. If we look at the statistics on our National Career Advice Portal, is that our statistics have increased over the past three years tremendously on the portal and with that, the telephone helpline support, the numbers went a little bit down. So that means that there was a move towards using online services and self-help services. And that is another thing that I found very interesting, is that people start getting a fay with self-help services, and they would rather go online and, and test out certain areas and help themselves. Another thing that uh, I want to respond to specifically what she has presented is the use of videos for career planning, for self-discovery, and produce the videos internally. One thing in South Africa that we're not very good in is to believe in that we can do it ourselves. We are really always want to outsource things like this, but I think you've proven that a very good video can be, can be produced in-house by our own people, because they are, in fact, the experts. And we have got beautiful young people that can appear on a video and assist. 
in providing information and advice to people like the CV that you have introduced us to. I wish I could understand your language. But then the next point I want to respond to is the interactivity. I've picked up when you said um, after they have done the CV, then you can go and present your CV to advisor to assist you or to give comments on your CV. And I think the, the whole issue of using multiple platforms all the time throughout your work is very important. And it's not only an online platform of only the portal, but also have interoperability between using different platforms to suit the need of the people and have and be people focused and not technology focused. And then one thing that I think we have to, to really think much more on is the customer feedback. It will be great to report on the use of our online services during uh, the COVID time. What I can say is that because we had the, the services before the time, the online services before the time, like the National Career Advice Portal, as well as the Career Helpline, the, the services that, that was offered through telephone services, we have moved that to, um, to provide career decision-making, subject choices, and applications for post-school opportunities, amongst others, and during the lockdown, with the requirement for career advisors to work remotely, the helpline advisors have used what we call Grand Stream Wave, a soft phone application that allows them to connect remotely to their workstations from home. And more specifically, it facilitates the making and receiving of calls as if the advisor is at the office. So, the, again, the focus on the user is very important they still use the same, the same call in line, the same telephone number to call in. They don't know that the advisor is sitting at home. And I think we can learn a lot from them that people don't need to be in an office all the time. Although you said the issues about uh, balancing family time and so forth is a challenge, we have to do, look at that. We have, for example, during the lockdown, and, and it is for me amazing that we have assisted 4,911 cases through the helpline and using the Grand Stream Wave application. And then the advisors have additionally been able to continue to provide the service and the information through the services, like the, the website, like I said, the Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, and then also the National Career Advice Portal the information hub for teachers that we've already established, the chat line, the email and Facebook. <coughs> Sorry. The Career Development Counseling Unit has continued to administer career choice and subject choice assessment and questionnaires online to support clients in their career planning, subject choices and labor market related decisions, uh, primarily through the Career Advice Portal and our online uh, platforms. As you know, the, the focus in South Africa is very much on skills development. So we have supported our technical and vocational education and training colleges. And we have developed the interest questionnaire that uh, has been initiated as part of the current student registration. And we have trained officials, 11 online sessions with over 80 officials, as well as support services in nine sessions. And we have reached all our TV colleges in the country, all 50 of them with 263 sites. And there were over 217 officials attending this. So what I can say is that although, like you said, it was so, so sudden and people were not prepared for this, people have adapted very quickly to the new normal. And... It did not hold us back. We also did information sessions, for example, for grade 12 learners in KwaZulu-Natal, the North Coast region, with where we did our apply now and PSET options as well as NSFAS. So I think when we look at the quality of service, the thing that you have raised is we have to think about the new normal. Quality is not necessarily in face-to-face, -face, and we have to think about the quality of online services also. And I think that is the way that we have to go. 
And the training in the using the tools and managing information, advice and guidance counseling online is for me a very important issue. And we can learn from you and share even what we have learned on how to support the advisors through the supervision and the peer-to-peer -peer guidance. And I would like to hear what your experience were in that regard. Um, then lastly, I want to focus on the online job fairs. Ooh, that is a very exciting idea. And we hope that we can work with our partners to build up on this idea. Because every time that we do, for example, our Mandela Day Career Development Festival, the cost of traveling and bringing people to a venue and bringing children and learners to a venue is so high. And how can we use different technologies? And I like the way that you said you've used the malls, you've used the buses, your taxis, and so forth. That is very exciting. And I think that is one thing that we can learn from you. But how do you get 38,000 participants in one job fair? I wish we can learn more from you on that. And then I think thanks for this presentation. And this is a very good opportunity to harness the new normal to bring the people for us in the rural area. And I think it will work brilliantly that we bring the, the technology to the people and assist people there and not necessarily bring people to a venue and, and centrally. But thanks for your presentation. I've learned a lot and I hope the rest of the participants also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Trudy Van Veek, for your analysis on that case study. I think you've really helped unpack it well, and you've got our participants definitely thinking. I can already see people now engaging with the chat, which is awesome. Um, next up, we're going to have Mr. Ratasalele. He's the principal psychologist at the Department of Employment and Labor. Uh, Mr. Salele, do you mind if I ask you to put your video on and unmute your audio? And then while he's busy doing that, I'd love to really encourage and thank those that have already been posting the chat. But remember, post in the chat, mark it as a question or a comment so that we are able to then address it at a later stage. Mr. Salele, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. Can you okay, thank you, sir. And over to you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Your audio is a little bit low, however. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, because the technician is still assisting me. There we go. That sounds perfect. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, for hosting uh, this webinar. Uh, I think it's very, very crucial to be able to, uh, you know, convey this message that is very critical to, to our listeners. Uh, I also want to uh, to take this opportunity to to respond to uh, Ms. Christina Orion's uh, presentation on the case study. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was very informative. So thank you very much. I hope we will also be able to reach that stage that you are in now. Okay. Um, on, on my responses, uh, I think I will also give you a brief uh, background of uh, what the uh, Department of Labor is offering, especially the branch in which I'm working in. Uh, the branch that I'm working in is Public Employment Services, and then is consisted of two chief directorates such as work seeker and employer services. So those are the two branches that we have. Uh, and then the work seeker services is the one that offers support to the work seekers uh, in terms of employability enhancement. And then the employer services is the one that, you know, uh, facilitate in the canvassing of opportunities. Uh, for today's uh, sessions, uh, I will talk about particularly the Wexica support services. Uh, under the Wexica support services, we have uh, career and employment counseling services, and we also have the ESA. ESA is 
an electronic machine system which registered which registers the, the work seekers and the opportunities from the employers. And then we also have career and employment counseling. Recently, we were able to, uh, to have an electronic you know, employment counseling module whereby uh, uh, the, the work seekers are able to uh, register themselves online because the majority of the services are, or, or, that the kind of labor is offering are online, which is good. It's like we anticipated that uh, we would be in this, you know, COVID-19. So the service were interrupted, but were not significantly, you know, interrupted in such a way that people did not get the services. So at least uh, people can be able to register themselves online and ask for the career and employment counseling services. And then we also have uh, the value add psychometric assessment and selection services, which we recently, you know, incorporated the remote assessments so that it can be accessible to people who need this service. Uh, we also have uh, this is just a background so that you can see what we are currently offering. Uh, we also have the employability enhancement programs. Uh, this employability enhancement programs, I can also relate to the work readiness programs, which of course, uh, at the moment, we also have what is called employ employment schemes. So I think that the three, they talk to each other because we are trying to uh, make the, 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 the work seekers ready for the labor market. So we do provide the life skills, we do provide the career information, the job hunting skills, person job fit, we provide the work ethics, we also provide the advocacy campaigns, we also provide articles, etc. Uh, because we are still learning in, uh, in the new, new normal, uh, there are some programs that have been made, especially on the advocacy campaign. Uh, Gauteng was able to host the advocacy campaign, you know, online, which was it's a, it's a very good news, which the Estonian government is also doing. So obviously, there is no uh, a, a, a huge gap between what they are doing and what we are doing currently. And then we also have other modes of transmission. Uh, that we are currently using. We have the kiosk, you know, those are the self-help line uh, services that we provide. We have the videos. We have also the WhatsApp that we've also introduced recently. We also have the social media. So uh, there is an address there. Uh, there there's a website. Uh, when, we, when you log into the website, www.dol dot uh, have dot z a z a then you'll be able to access all those you know videos that are talking about and the social media and then again uh, under public employment services public employment services has a footprint i heard you talking about the decentralization we have a footprint of 126 labor centers and we also have satellite office you know, countrywide, you know, for to enable uh, the work seekers, even the employers to access, you know, the public employment services. We also have 142 uh, professional psychology staff registered with the HPSSA. So, uh, meaning that it gives the amount of labor an edge, you know, to move towards the professionalization of the service. And the service is free of charge, just like in Estonia, it's free of charge for all citizens, even for people that are coming from outside. And then uh, number two, I'm gonna come, uh, I'm gonna talk about the current challenges. The current challenges that we have, you know, following this, you know, COVID-19, even before COVID-19, we still have a huge unemployment. 
uh, that is the, the biggest challenge that we have, especially among the youth. So it obviously exacerbated, you know, after, you know, during and after the COVID-19. And then we also have un underemployment that's also huge. We also have serious poverty, especially, you know, among African people. And there is still, you know, a, an inequality a, that is still haunting us, you know, you know, emanating from our leaders. Uh, then the other challenge that we have is uh, the services, unfortunately, in the public services are disintegrated, you know, among all role players. So if uh, we can try and make sure that all the services that we offer, uh, uh, you know, the public should be integrated, I think it will make a big, a big impact to our people. And then we also have a serious mismatch of skill set to available opportunities uh, that could obviously emanate from the inefficiencies, you know, in the educational and academic curriculum. And then the other challenge that we have is that we have a, a lack of research information on labor market trends. Uh, we have also a shortage of, you know, uh, information on, you know, the skills that are required uh, by the labor market. Uh, and then also we have, you know, a lack of information on entrepreneurial development opportunities, which our people must take advantage of because that is an alternative a road that all of us, you know, should have because everybody in South Africa must actually have entrepreneurial skills so that a person can survive irrespective of, you know, what comes, you know, uh, in the position of the person. And then we also have a lack of sufficient uh, psycho social economic activities, you know, services. Uh, we also have limited technological education and structure. We also have, you know, vast divide between the rural and urban areas. Uh, I had Dr. Van, Van Weg talking about it. Uh, that divide should, that gap should actually be closed because it causes a serious, you know, uh, huge migration into the urban areas. And then we also have a serious digital data cost and internet inaccessibility. Uh, as Dr. Van Seyl has spoken to, uh, we should not actually concentrate more on, you know, the electronic interaction, uh, but at the same time, uh, it is a reality that uh, in the urban uh, rural areas, uh, people do not have access uh, to internet. So if we can try and uh, bridge that divide between the rural and the urban areas, because that I, I wonder what the people in the rural, rural areas did, especially during uh, COVID-19, because obviously the inaccessibility of the service was very huge. And then let me then come to the impact, you know, of COVID-19 and the opportunities that, you know, it provided for us as South Africans. Um, COVID-19, uh, for me, when I, 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 I describe it, is, is a major, you know, career shock uh, because it impacted on people's work and the career. So there was a lot of, you know, adjustment, you know, challenges uh, that had to be made, you know, in, as individuals, families, employers, and everybody. So it was definitely a career shock. And then it also produced, you know, both positive and uh, negative effects. But I always believe that we have the responsibility to reframe the negative effects into positive gains. 
Uh, it is our responsibility because this COVID-19 has actually enabled us uh, to reflect and to provide you know, more efficient services to our people. And then um, there's also a need to develop career competences and skills for adaptation, uh, employability, and resiliency, especially after we have learned from COVID-19. We, there is a need to develop career competences and skills for people to be able to adapt and become, can, 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 uh, become more employable and to become more resilient, irrespective of the challenge they're confronted with. And then the other point is uh, we have uh, imposed, uh, the COVID-19 imposed a forced mind shift uh, amongst all of us uh, because it exposed you know, a lot of things and it also forced, forces us to think out of the box of uh, alternative solutions uh, that can you know improve our lives uh, we have the online communication and education uh, that has been introduced through the COVID, uh, and those are the viable, viable means of, of uh, viable means that we can actually take advantage of uh, especially because uh, they contributed in cast, cutting the costs and the time that were normally experienced, you know, from moving from one place to the other, uh, because there were a lot of travelings and booking expenses that were incurred in the meantime. So all those uh, cost and time savings should actually be redirected to enhance, you know, our interventions and. Uh, the other very important element that COVID-19 has taught us is uh, we should have what is called career or job di di diversification. In other words, uh, it is necessary to maximize one's chances to survive in alternative employment offerings and it eliminate you know, redundancy. So it, it opens options for, for one, not to become, you know, stranded uh, whenever, you know, any major uh, shock uh, is happening or disaster is happening. So uh, that is also a very important issue here. And then we should all, I, I also, uh, it, uh, it also con uh, helped us as well to have what is called a continual career evolution. A, car, a, car, a continual career evolution is a continuous development path. Uh, it, in, it, it, in, it enables people to navigate easily to changing work and personal environments. These are some of the things that we got from uh, COVID-19. And then uh, obviously uh, it also introduced what is called the work from home, which also yielded you know, positive options. And then it also exposed the deep-seated weaknesses in the public service systems and processes. So which of course we need to reflect and attend to those weaknesses in order to improve our, our service delivery. Uh, the last one that I'm going to talk about is the recommendation. Obviously, it's going to be also be based on the case study uh, that was delivered. Uh, first one under the recommendation, uh, I think there must be a career development and employment interventions that should be contextualized uh, and it must be in indigenous, you know, kind of career development. And the employment interventions must also be indigenous and contextualized uh, to, to be able to uh, talk directly to the needs of the people on the surface. Uh, there's also a need to uproot systemic issues of poverty 
unemployment, in inequality, and employability. Uh, there is also a, a recommendation on uh, the multimodal approach. Uh, the multimodal approach, the holistic approach, you know, to be able to respond appropriately to the psychosocial economic services. Uh, the integration of those services is very, very important. And then you must get rid of this uh, generalized, you know, silo mentality. Uh, we just have to root it out. And then also uh, we have a need to increase career employment centers. And these career employment centers must not be done, you know, uh, in isolation by the stakeholders, but they must be informed by the social societal needs. We have to involve our societies and our communities so that they can, you know, be able to take full ownerships uh, of those uh, employment centers. And then the, another recommendation is digital, digitalization should become a norm for everybody across uh, democratic lines. Uh, there must also be, you know, improvement in the accessibility of the digitalization to people with disabilities. And then the other one is the identification and removal of various barriers uh, hindering full access to services. We have to identify and remove all those various barriers that could hinder, you know, the, the access to our services, particularly the language is also an issue there because uh, in, in the majority of our labor centers, you might find that uh, some of our labor centers are in the townships and then uh, you find that maybe some of the practitioners are unable to communicate effectively with uh, those people in the townships. So it is very, very important that in, whenever you know, appointments have been made, we must take that into consideration. And then I also had um, Christina talking about uh, the customer evaluation services. That is very, very, very important. We should actually adopt it in order to enable, you know, progressive, you know, improvement and refinement of uh, our services. Uh, the other one is uh, currently, uh, because obviously we are going towards the end of the year, there is going to be a high, you know, uh, and it's also particularly following the COVID-19, we, uh, we are experiencing a high, you know, uh, dropout of people because of some challenges, you know, that emanated from home due to financial strains. And then obviously there will be a lot of metrics that will be coming out from high schools and the, 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 the graduates that will also be coming from the teacher universities. So obviously we should proactively uh, come up with multi-stake career employment programs just to make sure that we intervene, you know, in a proactive way. And we also have the current socio-economic relief schemes that were introduced during COVID-19. I normally call them the passive labor market programs. They should actually be adopted, but in a way that they should be transformed into active labor market programs. Uh, the last point uh, that I'm having um, is opportunity and data providers. And the communities should always be incorporated into the career employment commissions. They should not be, be left behind. And then also the last, last, you know, uh, 
a proverb that I took from the Chinese uh, literature. It says that may you live in interesting times where in survival skills is the norm. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. So then I think I will uh, wait for any questions that you might have concerning my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Salele, for your response, as well as your great overview of what the Department of Employment and Labor is doing to help with the career services. Also, thank you for highlighting the different ways that we can engage with your department's offerings. And one of the things you really mentioned that resonate with me is making sure we feed into improving entrepreneurial skills, because I think we all know that the power of small business and creating employment is, is rather a big one. Next up, we've got our second respondent, who's Dr. Tashmia Ismail. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Youth Employment Service. Dr. Ishmael, I'd love to invite you to activate your video and unmute your audio. And while she's doing that, I'd love to remind the audience, please post any comments and questions you have for Dr. Ismail so that she can answer in our Q&A session. Dr. Ismail, if you're ready, I'd love to hand over to you. Thank you so much for having me on this panel today. Um, thoroughly enjoyed the uh, presentation on the Estonian model around career services and also uh, getting a view into what, we, what we're doing um, in South Africa. I'm a huge fan of the Estonian case study, not just in terms of the, the particular case that we've seen today, but the entire ability of a country to, to move itself to such an, uh, a level of efficiency that almost everything in the country, uh, in every uh, space within your life, um, there is an efficiency built into being able to do this through a digital platform. And this goes into not just into education and career services, but extends into healthcare, being able to apply for your documents, um, home affairs type documents online. It, it, it really is globally um, a, a paragon for, for us all to strive towards. And, you, you know, whilst there may be um, some loss in jobs by digitizing so much of, of the economy, there is an incredible uh, efficiency that is built in the ease of doing business, in competitiveness, in helping young people to access opportunities. And we really need to think uh, about looking and, and, and calculating and measuring the amount of positives in our economy and the chances that it opens up because digitizing really does democratize things for, for, for many young people and people who are cut off in our economy. If we look at the Kenyan example of uh, M-Pesa, digitization of money and being able to move money through, through digital channels um, was, was a huge democratizer where financial services that allowed people to save and start businesses was, was only for people in the city who could access banks. So I think that's, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that's my first comment, uh, given the presentation, which we're very grateful for, is there's a lot more to learn from Estonia than, than just this particular case study around career services. The, then I'd like to talk to where we do need to be very cognizant of the differences between Estonia and South Africa. And the first big one was, you know, our speaker talked about the Estonian population at 1.3 million, uh, South Africa's on, on close to 58 million population. And just our um, neat number, not in employment, educational training number is over 8 million. Uh, whereas youth youth number of needs, whereas in um, Estonia the entire population is 1.2. We're talking scale on on a on a very different size. And then what what has to be mentioned, I think, is GDP per capita, the economic profile um, of Estonia, where GDP per capita is twenty three thousand two hundred sixty six dollars, which is a two thousand and eighteen figure, and South Africa's GDP per capita is six thousand three hundred seventy four. So, you know, almost four times the GDP per capita, and we, we also have the highest inequality in the world. So in Estonia, we have a homogenous population, largely one language, everybody living with reasonably similar quality of, of life. Whereas in South Africa, access for many people to be able to, to 
to get into the whole world of digital access is dependent on structural uh, inequalities, whether they can afford devices, data, and the infrastructure delivering high speed, high quality data into their communities. So I think those are just some of the things that we, we need to work around. Um, while the speaker was talking, I found a, a, a book. I just went to search for a book that I had read on uh, called Randomistas. And to just play a slight devil's advocate, their huge values um, and, and, and positives to be derived from digital infrastructure. But it doesn't mean that the psychology of, of getting a job and career services can't also be delivered in an analog fashion. And there's a brilliant book that I read called Randomistas, which described a very simple, simple program in uh, in Germany. And get this, it was printed leaflets, which is, you know, in the context of today sounds really medieval. But if you will allow me just to read this passage from Randomistas. Occasionally, inexpensive interventions have a significant payoff. In 2010 and 2011, the German government posted out a cheerful blue brochure to over 10,000 people who had recently lost their jobs. A cheerful blue brochure. The color matters. Uh, Blieben Sie aktiv, translated, stay active. The leaflet urged unemployed people. It discussed how the German economy had been recovering after the financial crisis reminded people that unemployment can be bad for your physical and mental health and suggested different ways in which they might look for a job. The leaflet boasted, uh, boosted employment rates among those who received it. Each leaflet cost less than a euro to print and post, which we could definitely do cheaper, but boosted earnings among the target group by an average 450 euro. If you know another government intervention with a payoff rate of 450 to 1, the author writes, I want to hear about it. So I think there are methods that we can use that range from um, digital uh, methods. And, and I'd like to share a few slides on what YES is doing on digital methods. So we certainly invest a huge amount of time and money in thinking about how we reach our youth across the country with digital. But that doesn't uh, discount that if you understand behavioral economics and people's behaviors through simple analog methods like this German example, you can have a return of 450 to 1 um, on employment outcomes. This also bears, um, uh, this also brings me back to some work that JPAL did with Harambi in South Africa, where they looked at action plans that youth can create in order to search for a job. And if we could teach young people how to search for a job, I'm so glad to see um, from, from our speakers that a lot of work is being done on psychometrically profiling youth and assisting them through hopefully an action plan to understand what their skills and potentials are and how to connect them to platforms where jobs that are suited to their profiling will appear. Because I think a lot of people get, get muddled in the complexity of understanding their skills, capabilities, qualifications, and what sector that fits in and where you find opportunities in that sector. And then also how you can micro-credential your way into be becoming better suited for a career where there may be potentials. And I'm going to try and experiment here. Um, I hope the organizers don't mind, but uh, I'm going to, to screen share um, a, a window. Can you guys see my presentation? I just wanted to show you what uh, what Yes is is doing. Can you see that presentation? So nothing is up yet on my side. Okay, uh, let me do this. Let me just cancel and reshare. Please bear with me. It, I, I, you know, if I can show you the, if I can show you the pictures, I think it makes a big difference. Can you see this now? 
No, nothing on my side. Let me just check with the technical team if they are able to help you. That should be now visible. Yes, that okay, is now visible. Right. So um, what the Youth Employment Service does is we assist young people um, into a first work opportunity. We work on the demand side of the economy. So we work with the private sector to say, please um, help us open work opportunities for young people for a year so that we can break the cycle of young people saying, I can't get a job without experience. I can't get experience without a job. We've got, because of structural factors in our country and network factors, a lot of youth are just, even with huge potential, are never given that first opportunity to get into a job. We worked with the DTIC um, for a year that if companies invest in these youth jobs, we allow youth to get, we allow the company to get a level up on the BE scorecard. And so it's a win-win. We're incentivizing companies to open new job opportunities, which is very difficult in the current climate um, because nobody wants to increase their payroll during economic uh, recession and particularly given COVID. So it's important that you have some kind of incentive um, to get the private sector to create jobs. Uh, you know, you can have as many career services as you want, but the bottom line is an economy has to be generating jobs for young people to get into. Now, where are we at uh, with YES today? This number is slightly dated. We have now created, um, with the private sector, 40,450 work opportunities for young people. That is about 2.2 billion in salaries into youth wallets. Um, so this is what YES has been busy with for the past 21 months. And what is very exciting and I think relevant for today is we've spent a lot of time on our digital platform um, uh, to, to connect youth into training and workplace skills um, understanding. And on our digital platform, which has been zero rated by Vodacom, we've already logged 6.3 million learning minutes on this platform. And what I was really happy to hear from the Estonian case was this idea around exposing young people to inspirational speakers. There's a big psychology to finding the right career and fit, um, which is which very importantly is about the youth mindset and being inspired to believe that this is possible for them, which is why in order to, to get these, these learning minutes, we thought very carefully about the content um, that we would put onto our smartphones, which are zero rated. So we want youth to learn how to transact digitally, how to access a digital address and put themselves on the, the digital map where they can access a whole new network of opportunities that might not be available in their local environment or through their network connections. So we encourage youth, youth to build a digital CV to get this out onto LinkedIn and various career platforms. And then we've built our content with a very strong um, behavioral economics and behavioral influence where we use growth mindset tools, nudges and reward systems um, to help youth to shift their, their mindset on what their capabilities are and, and, and what is available for them out in the workplace. And then, of course, access to this training material. So we've done some of what the Estonian case has been describing. We've used a lot of young people to create peer learning material, uh, getting young people to understand themselves, lots of tips and tricks on putting a CV together, but also using video, an entertaining video, uh, to, to get young people to understand what this, what this is about. We've interviewed uh, HR leaders in, inside of the private sector and we've got them on video talking to young people about these tips and tricks on what they should put into a CV, what they look for, when do they just push a CV aside. And some of that material is not just available on our smartphone, but on the For Youth portal on our website. And I have a slide um, on some of these tips and tricks that you can find on the For Youth tab on, on the Yes website, which is Yes For Youth with the number four. So we tell youth, get to know yourself first, identify yourself and your, your skills and potentials, and then step by step, taking them through uh, CV preparation, both through a document and through this video that we've, we've created. 
And what you see here is, is what we have on our smartphone, the Yes uh, for Youth smartphone app. We have animations where young people are guided through the world of work by other young people so they can understand what to expect in the workplace, um, why it's so important to have a good fit in terms of yourself and the job that you go for. But this, this uh, centre um, uh, slides will give you um, an idea of the, the style of the content that we're developing. It's telenovela style where young people can learn and get guidance through storytelling rather than trying to get them to work through PDFs or complex sites. They work through the learnings, through the stories of other young people. And peer learning can be incredibly inspirational and a powerful mover for young people. Um, this picture that you see here is the first step in building your profile. It's another app on the, uh, that is zero rated, where we give, uh, give young people nudges, uh, to think about reflections, we survey them. And the entire idea behind our behavioral shift program is to build confidence for people to access the workplace and once they're in um, stress and socio-emotional management, I think we underestimate the anxiety and psychological uh, sort of breakdown of not having the dignity of a job. And you almost have to build that up uh, in order to prepare young people for the technical parts of job search. Um, we, we also get them to think about financial, personal financial management. So when they start to get those jobs, they understand about saving, communication and interpersonal skills so that they really nail it at the interview, at the job interview, um, and just give them tools to plan for the next step. Uh, given that JPAL work on how important action plans are, in, in the creation um, uh, of an opportunity for yourself. And these are just some pictures to show our youth interacting on their phones. It really, like I said, 6.3 million learning minutes. Um, uh, you know, I, I hope that we are applying some of the best practice that we've seen in this Estonian case with our Yes Youth across the country. And what is fantastic about these digital platforms it, not just in terms of career search, but in terms of just generally is the speed at which you can do things. So when COVID hit and lockdown hit, we wanted to be able to give our 40,000 youth, uh, you know, immediate tools to understand how to manage and deal with COVID and the emotional stress. So in, in, a, in a week, within a week, we had created and uploaded these modules with yoga practices on breathing and mindfulness and COVID management, uh, a COVID management um, module on becoming a COVID warrior and how to beat COVID. And we got this up onto the platform really quickly. So, so what this, these digital methodologies give you is also um, an incredible speed of response, a flexibility and agility. And this is how young people behave. They, they digitally native. If they have the access, they're very quick to pick up on this. Um, and so, of course, as a provider of services, you've got to show real competency in being able to deliver that, that agility. And I think this is what we see in, in Estonia across sectors is an incredible agility to deal with things um, as they arise. So today, if you go to Estonia and you land, you immediately get a, a message on your phone that gives you the option of taking a test as soon as you get to the airport, a COVID test, um, or going into two weeks of quarantine. If you select the COVID test, you're isolated for that night. By the next morning, you are given your COVID test results and you can then move into the country freely. So rather than cutting off the entire country from visitors coming in, which bring with them important investment dollars, important IP for the country, they've created a, a system to very quickly continue with um, uh, people coming into the country, but in a safe way. And, and, and I think this is the power of, of learning from the Estonian example, um, is, is how do we recover our economy and give youth the chance by, by harnessing um, speed and agility through digital. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tash, for your response on the Estonian case study. I think you brought up some very valid and very interesting points there. And again, another thank you for giving us a great look into what the Youth Employment Service has been doing. I think I love the thoroughness of your guys' activities. You're not just doing box ticking activities. So I think it is really awesome. We are now going to my personal favorite part of the webinar, which is the Q&A session, because it allows everyone who's been viewing and attending to actually engage with our speakers. So could I please ask our speakers to put their videos on, um, and then I will request you unmute your mic as and when I then bring the questions to you. Um, I want to just thank again our questions and comments our moderator, who's been fielding the questions in the chat um, as we've been going. So speakers, um, our videos are on there. Thank you, and I want to see if Tash's video can go on as well, as well as Mr. Salele. Thank you very much. Um, so my first question it comes from Nogulunga, and this is directed to Mr. Salele, and it asks, you know, how do you ensure that your services are known and available in poor communities like rural areas and informal settlements? So Mr. Salele, if you can unmute your mic and maybe respond to that question. Okay, thank you for, for the question. Uh, as I've indicated, we have... Um, apologies, Mr. Talele. Do you mind if I just uh, get us to check your audio again? Um, it's sounding a little bit low. Can you hear me now? It, it's still, it's a little bit better, but still low. Maybe you can move a bit closer to the laptop. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's perfect. Thank you, sir. So I'll allow you okay. to respond to that question. Okay. As I've indicated, uh, we have a footprint of 126 labor centers together with the satellites, you know, offices, you know, you know, across, you know, the country. So obviously they will be accessible. And then you also have the outreach programs that career counselors who are registered as professional psychologists uh, you know, career counselors, uh, together with the psychometrist, they do conduct uh, outreach programs. So they do go to the community and offer those services. I think I've answered that question. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we've got here comes from Taryn van Firin, and the question reads as follows. What is the average age of those attending the job fairs? Um, is it mostly aimed at the youth and attended by the youth? I think this question is for Ms. Orion um, in terms of in Estonia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, the first uh, uh, online uh, job fair that we had was mostly uh, uh, addressed for the young people under the age of 26. But it was not restricted to um, to anybody else. So if, if an adult wanted to take part, it was available for them as well. But the job offers that we had online and the employers that we had online um, could mark certain vacancies that were also um, available for uh, young people or, or even underage pe uh, young people. So it was the, up to the employer to put on the information about that. The second one that we had in the, um, September and October um, was uh, addressed for the general population. So it was adults mostly, I would say, uh, but young people also could attend. So uh, it was not um, it was not restricted to anybody. I don't have a, a specific data uh, on the age of participants because we didn't have any uh, questionnaire. Uh, for the person who uh, joined the expo online. So uh, we don't know for sure. Thank you very much, Christina, for your response there. Um, the next question we've got comes from Abigail Baloy, who says, thank you, Mr. Salele, for the informative presentation. I'm interested in knowing if the WhatsApp channel is very effective or not, and would you re recommend it in providing career development services? So if Mr. Salel is still there, maybe he can put his video on and respond to whether or not the WhatsApp channel has been effective in delivering career services. Okay. It seems maybe we might be having some uh, technical challenges with Mr. Salele. Let me go on to the next question that we've got there. 
We've got a question from Melissa, um, Melissa Christians, and Melissa says, uh, thank you very much. I note that there are no walk-in centers available for the youth in the Northern Cape. Are there any plans to open one? I don't know, maybe Ms. Ms. Van Veek might be able to answer this question. Thank you. I think the question is, uh, is uh, towards the Department of uh, employment and uh, labor because the Department of Higher Education and Training does not have walking centers. We are partnering, partnering with the Department of Employment and Labor, for example, with other departments, with uh, provincial departments. I know there's a lot that has been opened in Pumalanga with the Department of Social Development, and we work with schools, with colleges and universities. So we don't have uh, walking centers ourselves. So we we are working on a partnership basis with other um, partners. So I think the question is more towards the Department of uh, Employment and Labor. But I think it's a very important question that he's asking, because how do we get the information to the people in the in the rural areas? And that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trudy. I see we've got Mr. Talela back and maybe I'll put the question uh, to him as well in that case. Um, I've got a question here again from Samuel Chabalala and Samuel says, how does one apply for a YES program? He says we are a registered skills development center. I think uh, uh, Dr. Ismail might be best to answer this question. Dr. Ismail, I think your audio is muted, if you don't mind unmuting for us. Sure, apologies. Can you repeat that for me, please? So Samuel's asking, how does one apply for a YES program? And then he says, we are a registered skills development center. Yeah, so the, the Youth Employment Service, uh, as I mentioned in, in my 10 minutes, works with the private sector to open new jobs. Once, uh, let's, let's take a company like Nestle, for example. If Nestle has opened up um, uh, jobs, they, it's up to them to decide who they want to use to place youth into that job. So we create a very agnostic platform. We, uh, because we're an NPO, we can't show favoritism to any one training company. So we're not pres prescriptive. Companies can decide who they want to recruit and place their youth and train their youth. Now, remember also, YES is a national program. So we've got young people coming into work with complete entry-level uh, skill sets. They don't even have a matric certificate. We've got youth in KwaZulu-Natal who are going into uh, training around recycling, removal of non-Indigenous species. And these young people are getting training at their level, which is very, very entry-level. And then we've got people going into the banking sector. Um, with very sophisticated qualifications. And so the, the range and nature of, of YES placements is extremely varied. Um, and, and this is why we allow employers to make their own decisions on training providers and where and how they recruit youth. We try to promote that youth are recruited locally from local communities when those opportunities are close to communities, the work opportunities are close to communities. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail, for that response. Um, the next question I've got comes from Likile Sibohodi, and Likile says, good morning. Are there career services um, international and, and multilingual? I think she's referring to, or sorry, he or she is referring to the uh, Mr. Ryan's uh, Estonian um, case study. So are there services international and multilingual? And do they have anything that they offer in Africa and more specifically South Africa? Uh, Mr. Ryan, over to you. Mm -hmm. uh, our career services are available in Estonian, uh, in Russian, and in English as well, but they are mostly targeted to Estonian um, uh, inhabitants, uh, so not citizens, uh, they don't have to be citizens, but if they are um, currently in Estonia looking for a job or educational opportunity, they, they can apply for their career services. But also, if, if a person is thinking about moving into Estonia, so I think that um, in, in that case, uh, uh, we have um, a separate portal, Work in Estonia, uh, which addresses this kind of questions. And if, if a person wants to have career counselling, 
they can also contact our organization and we can um, find a solution for that. Thank you very much, Ms. Orion. Um, our next question comes from uh, Mosa Ramaru. And the question is, is the YES app in collaboration with the Department of Labor? And what distinguishes it from the ESSA, E-S-S-A, online service? Um, Dr. Ismail, I don't know if you want to take a stab at that one. Sure. So, so the um, app is not done in, in collaboration with the Department of Labor. YES is a not-for-profit organization that is funded by the private sector. We um, built this app to ensure that when youth are placed in opportunities around the country, they can access the app, which acts as a mentor in their pocket to help them build workplace-based skills in bite-sized nuggets of videos and peer learning to support them through that year of work opportunity. Uh, we did have some discussions with uh, the, the Department of Labor quite early on that um, we would try to get some kind of API so if job opportunities opened that some of the database of the Department of Labor could be put, put forward for those roles. But the YES app is very much about a mentor in your pocket that teaches you workplace-based skills through animations, videos and assessments and allows you to build a series of, of certificates um, that you have completed modules that build these workplace-based behaviors. What it also has is 12 modules on business literacy, um, which helps you to think about an entrepreneurial career once you've finished your year-long work experience. So it's, it's quite different content um, uh, in terms of what it delivers. It's a curriculum that it delivers. Thank you very much for that response, Tash. Um, the next question we've got is from Chris Bukes, and it reads as follows. Is it a good, um, sorry, is it good to see how you approached the career development services during the lockdown in Estonia? Um, what is the number of people in the career development team and what are their qualifications? I think this question then is for Ms. Orion. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a central uh, career um, design and development team in uh, head office. Uh, which is uh, uh, nine uh, people, uh, in including me. And uh, the main uh, background of these um, colleagues of mine is uh, they, ha they all have uh, higher education, but in different sectors. So uh, in psychology, in education, in social work, and also in economics. Uh, and uh, in Estonia, if you work as a career uh, practitioner, you don't have to have uh, specifically career practitioner um, education because we don't have this in higher education. Uh, but if you have a higher education in these sectors, we will provide um, uh, like um, an introductory uh, education in-house. Uh, and also they mostly have um, experience in the, working as a career practitioner. Thank you very much, Ms. Orion. Um, I do have another question that's coming your way from Melissa Christians. And the question reads as follows. Ms. Orion, how do you centralize information for your virtual career events? Did you request this from the employers prior to the event, or did you share links on the day of the event for the employment opportunities, employer contacts and recruitment portals uh, that job seekers could access? I don't know if you can talk to that. Yes. Uh to have this kind of online uh, job fair, we had a partner who uh, who is a private company who owns this um, online expo environment, uh, and uh, they collected the data from the employers and put it uh, online. So it was um, not done by by our employees in in unemployment insurance fund but uh, we had a partner who was uh, outsourced i know Sorry. if this answers the question yeah yes thank you very much uh Ms. ryan um our next question is for mikateko koza and the question reads as follows how best can the DET support CETAs during this time to access learners uh, maybe if Ms. uh van Veik is able to tackle that one 
Thanks for that one. I thought it's the question on connectivity because I expect that question to come very soon to the department. Yes, I think it's important if you look at our career development policy, there are three uh, structures that have been identified to manage career development services in South Africa. And one of them is our National Career Advice for a Career Development Forum that has got a CETA chamber. So we have got a formal structure where we're working with CETAs, and I would really uh, encourage Mr. Koza to contact the CDS uh, people at the department and get involved in that because it's so important. CETAs have got their specific chambers that they are working with, and they have to provide career development services to them. That's one of the KP KPAs. And it's so important that we work together and share, number one, the right information, the best quality information to all our citizens. And that is why it's important that we have to work with CETA. With CETA. So I would encourage him to contact the department and work with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Van Veek, for that response. Um, another question we've got here from Nogulunga says, which skills suffered the most due to COVID-19 and which ones emerged more due to COVID-19? I think this question is a, a little bit broad in general. I'd love to hear maybe everyone's responses to this one. Um, I don't know if I could ask um, Dr. Ismail to start and then we'll look at the other speakers. I mean, in, in terms of, of skill sets, um, I think we need to talk skill sets and jobs. Uh, a lot of what YES is about is learning by doing, learning on the job. And if you were in any sort of industry like tourism and hospitality, where you were needing to learn about customer interactions and you had face-to-face -face jobs where you couldn't do them digitally, but had to learn this through those on-site um, activations, those were probably the jobs where you got the most job losses. Um, and those are probably also the youth with the, the, the lowest skill sets and who needed those, those jobs most. So it is quite a tragedy that um, COVID has impacted people who really needed those jobs to be able to learn skills on the job. Whereas a lot of the more skilled youth grads, for example, who are working in companies were able to very quickly switch over uh, to working digitally and virtually. So we had youth up in Mpumalanga who were working on um, game ranging programs, uh, working in the hospitality industry, uh, learning uh, uh, how to be um, service staff in hotels and restaurants. And of course, many of those youth have had to sit at home and not have that work experience for all those months. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail. Uh, maybe I could ask uh, Ms. Van Veek to respond to the same questions um, of which skills or maybe even jobs suffered most during COVID-19 and which ones really emerged and were stronger um, as a result. Uh, thanks for, for the question. I think, uh, obviously, I think when we look at the media and, and responses that's coming from government, is our lower skilled people that are suffering the most. And, and I think um, Dr. Ishmael has just now uh, uh, said that. I think the people who are not skilled or the people are lo who are lo lowly skilled are the people who suffer the most. But I think when we look at the opportunities that COVID has brought, and I think that is where we have to look at, people must gain, must get themselves to get soft skills. And we're talking about this so many times, even in our advice that we give into career, in the career advice helpline, is um, people must find the information, get advice, how to equip yourself in soft skills. One of the soft skills that we are talking about now is just how to operate uh, in a virtual environment like we are working at the moment. That was one of the skills that everybody had to learn within the, the a blink of an eye. And then the whole issue of reskilling. You know, we were so fixed in I, I'm being skilled for a job. And you must rather think of how can I be reskilled to be more employable and not just for employment. So that is my response to that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Van Weyck. I think that's a great insight um, from your side there. Um, and lastly, maybe uh, to Ms. Orion, I want to see, you know, is there a difference um, when looking from the Estonian perspective, or is this problem really just a global one as it stands from your side? Yes, it all sounded very familiar for me as well. I think the people who have low skills suffered the most also in Estonia, uh, mainly because um, these were the jobs that were um, most uh, vulnerable to uh, maybe shut down during the, this period of time uh, and also the higher skilled jobs uh, uh, that we have in Estonia in a, a big part of those uh, were able to move to for example home offices and online uh, and they were not as uh, much vulnerable but when it comes to the certain um, areas I would say that uh, we had a uh, rise in um, ICT uh, jobs for obvious reasons uh, and also for some extent in healthcare, for example, uh, and also in some extent to, to um, agriculture. And this was mostly um, caused by, by our government decision not to let uh, foreign workers uh, enter the country in the spring. In, and in the summer as well. So uh, they had to find the um, local workforce very quickly. <clears throat> and, uh, and the main um, uh, area that suffered the most, uh, I think, in all of the countries was uh, tourism sector and also hotels, uh, restaurants and so on. So all the services that uh, were mostly provided face to face uh, for people and were also um, hoping for the tourists to enter the country and so on. So thank you. Thank you very much for your response, Ms. Orion. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to sort of, you know, put up one last question. It's more of a comment, but maybe uh, Ms. Van Veik can then respond to that particular comment. Uh, it comes from Nozi Pokumalo and she says, um, the access of digital Digitalization depends on the access of data and fiber broadband, which many South Africans do not have. Um, COVID-19 has shown us that we need to use the fourth industrial revolution, but also be realistic to our situation as a country. I don't know if Ms. Van Veik has got a, a response to that particular comment. Yes, I think that's a very important question that she's asked, Melissa. And coming from the Northern Cape, I think you and, and uh, Tanya, who is, are there, who know the work that we are doing, it's very important that we look at this much broader than only career development services. Government, and I'm very glad Nuzipu is here from the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. We are, are working with the Department of uh, Communications and Digital Technologies, firstly, to zero rate all educational websites. Yes has uh, said that we, their website is uh, zero rated by Vodacom. Uh, please contact us. We can zero rate it for all for the, the um, yes, it is, we, 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 that is what the minister has, uh, uh, has announced. We have already zero rated, um, I haven't got the statistics with me last time when I looked at it, it was 693 uh, websites of both private and public educational institutions. And I want to thank Vincent also for bringing the private educational providers also into this. So all the service providers, and that includes all the mobile operators as well as the internet service providers have to zero rate uh, educational websites. And we hope that when the lockdown is, is, and the state of disaster has been cleared, that we can continue with that and there are our negotiations with the mobile operators and the Department of Communication on that. So that's the first strategy. The second strategy is that we are providing educational bundles, a very reduced right to poor students so that they can have access to data in rural areas, even where there are connectivity. The third one and is it's exactly what um, uh, Melissa and others have said, is that the connectivity in rural areas are very poor. And we that is basically out of the hand of government because it's very much driven by industry. If there's not enough people wanting a connectivity, there are no connectivity normal in an in, in area. 
But what we are working with the Department of Communications as well as with the Department of Basic Education is to develop a dedicated educational network over the long term. That means that we put certain websites and certain services like, for example, the Career Development Services, the National Career Advice Portal is currently on that, uh, on that um, trajectory. So that means that a student anywhere can access that for free on any network or on any platform. And then our last strategy is that we're working with um, the Department of Science and Innovation and others to develop the South African Research and Educational Network. That's a very well-established network in the university environment where all universities have been connected to that already. Since last year, we have worked now to, to connect all the TV college campuses to the same network. That means, and because you must remember that TV colleges are developed in rural areas, are developed where people are, not like universities that's predominantly urban. So what we are getting now is that a, a campus in a rural area, TV college campus, can act as a hub for surrounding schools as well as surrounding communities to bring connectivity to the more rural areas. So that's in, in very short our four strategies that we are working toward connectivity. I know it will always be a problem, but we have to work together. And that is one of the biggest uh, challenges for us is that we're working with the Department of Communication, Science and Innovation, Basic Education, Health even, as well as with the private sector to get connectivity to rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Van Veek, for that response. And I really would love to thank the remaining part of our panelists and our speakers for all their great insights that they've been able to give us. Um, that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. And what I'd love to do right now is just show the results of the poll that we've been running. Um, and the poll question was, what has been the biggest challenge for you and your organization in providing career services during this lockdown period in South Africa? Now, what we have seen from that is that 51% of the respondents responded saying that the client's lack of internet access um, is their main reason. Then we have 20% of our people saying the lack of engagement by clients um, has been one of their reasons. Then 15% of our people said the lack of organizational resources um, was a reason. And then lastly, 12% of the respondents said inadequate staff readiness um, was the reason. But we can clearly see that lack of internet access being one of the biggest problems that we're facing as a country and probably um, a lot of parts of the world. I'll read simply just a few comments from our chat and then I'll hand over to Mr. Mukeki for the final closing. So from comments, we've got Ingrid van der Merwe, who says, we at UCT hosted a virtual expo and one of the main issues was data. Many students could log in, but not for very long, which again, you know, comes back to emphasize that point. Um, Nozugo Mafenya says, it is interesting that Estonia's online career and jobs fair expands the reach to wider Europe. South Africa has many international students Introducing online career and job fairs, we will hopefully reach students and young people beyond the SA borders, which I think is very, very true. Ronel Rizzo says, we, along with the majority of South African universities, collaborated with the South African Graduate Employees Association to stage virtual grad expo and 140 employers participated. I think that is very exemplary. And I think I'd love to commend those employers for really taking the initiative of getting involved. Lastly, we've got Nazrana Parker, who says, quite a few universities in South Africa now offer online careers services to its students and alumni via Career Hub and Simplicity CSM services. Right now, that brings us to the end of our Q&A and our comment section. I'd love to invite Mr. Letsiho Mukeki, who's the Director of the Career Development Services um, at the DHET, to really bring a nice summary for the webinar, as well as close off and give a vote of thanks. Mr. Mukeki, if you are there, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ranaka. Um, I believe you'll all agree with me that this was um, um, an, an inspirational and engaging session. Uh, on behalf of the department, we would like to thank you for joining us on the second and uh, of, a, of a set of three webinars where we're looking at uh, the provision of career services uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
uh, with a particular focus on, on lessons uh, we wanted to draw from uh, uh, the Estonia experience. Uh, to all our speakers, thank you for making the time from your busy schedules to honor this engagement. Uh, our deep felt gratitude to Ms. Christina Orion, uh, the deputy head of Department of Skills and Career Services at the Estonian Un Unemployment Insurance Fund um, for honoring this engagement and, um, and for giving us such an insightful um, you know, presentation um, and, and sharing with us uh, uh, their responsiveness in dealing with uh, issues of, uh, of COVID uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the 4IR uh, you know, uh, environment. Um, thank you to Ms. Trudy van Veek, uh, the Chief Director for Social Inclusion, Access, Quality and Equity at the Department of Higher Education and Training, you know, who responded and painted the picture you know, for us on, you know, on, on how the department um, and the country um, is, is, is responding uh, and has responded to issues of COVID and, and uh, lessons we have drawn from the Estonia experience and what we plan to, you know, to do going forward. Um, and then also uh, to Mr. Moraman uh, Kalele, the principal psychologist, uh, uh, in the public employment services at the, at the Department of Employment and Labor for sharing, you know, his thoughts, you know, on uh, lessons, you know, that we uh, we have drawn from both the Estonia experience and, and also just sharing with us what the Department of Labor has been working on. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, you know, thank you to, uh, you know, Dr. Tashmir Ismail, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer at the Youth Employment Service uh, thank you, uh, you know, Dr. Ismail, for your thoughts um, and especially your uh, your focus on you know how we can change you know youth mindset uh, you know going forward and the importance of balancing good quality uh, online platforms with good quality content and you know really uh, um, you know to think through uh, the intervention models you know to make them as inspirational interactive and as fun as possible. So thank you for sharing those lessons. Just in terms of announcements, um, a reminder that the link for this uh, webinar and previous ones will be sent, uh, you know, uh, via email to all of you um, and, and will also be posted on the CDS uh, Career Development Services YouTube channel, which you can visit um, at Career Development Services underscore Keta uh, on YouTube. Um, and at this web, web this uh, YouTube channel, you'll also find a range of career videos that we have produced. Um, and so we invite you to, you know, to join us uh, and, and check it out. Uh, the next webinar uh, will be this coming Thursday at 9.45 to 12. Um, um, and it's going to be on the digital divide, the realities of public education and training and the youth of South Africa. And so, a number of the questions that were raised today around the problems that you know of digital divide that uh, COVID has exposed, we're going to be uh, dealing with um, at that um, webinar, and we are excited to offer you a diverse and experienced set of speakers who will share with you uh, what initi initiatives are being implemented and challenges, uh, all less and lessons that uh, we are learning across government, nonprofit, and private sectors. Um, and also to just remind you that of the upcoming annual uh, stakeholder conference that will take place on the 19th and the 20th uh, of November. Um, final shout out to our staff and our supplier and all of you know you who are working behind uh, the scenes to ensure that we you know bring you know uh, all of you a quality experience uh, and in particular shout out to. Uh, Mr. Rangaka, who was the moderator today. And um, I just want to uh, thank you for joining us and um, um, invite you to join us again on Thursday. Uh, thank you.